All right, so this series of lectures is on the first half of chapter 13, where we're going to be focusing on microbial mechanisms of pathogenicity. So there's a few vocabulary words we have to cover before we begin. First of all, a pathogen is a microbe that causes an infection or a disease. So disease and pathogen are not interchangeable. Disease is a set of symptoms. The pathogen is the microbe that causes those symptoms. The severity of the symptoms or the severity of the disease depends on the pathogenicity of each individual pathogen and also the strength of each individual host's defenses. So host health is a component, the host's immune system is a component, but also the pathogenicity of each individual pathogen. So what is pathogenicity? So pathogenicity and or virulence. These pathogenicity and virulence, they're fairly interchangeable, these terms. So pathogenicity is the potential to cause disease. Virulence is the degree of pathogenicity. And I just use them interchangeably. Most people just use them interchangeably. So virulence or pathogenicity is driven by virulence factors. A virulence factor is a gene or a trait that helps a particular microbe cause an infection or cause a disease. And we'll cover virulence factors uh, as we move through. A primary pathogen is a pathogen that can cause disease even in strong and healthy individuals. So a primary pathogen is a microbe whose calling in life is to be a pathogen and not to be anything else. Now we're finding with the advent of next generation DNA sequencing, the, a lot of microbes we used to think of as pure pathogens are not actually pure pathogens. So, you know, microbes that cause strep, most people have them, but for some reason they only cause disease some of the time. So we'll talk about that more when we get to the microbiome, but so the number of primary pathogens is, we're finding is much smaller than we than we thought. But that's what we mean when we say primary pathogen is a microbe that can cause disease even in healthy individuals. An opportunistic pathogen, on the other hand, is a, a microbe that only causes disease uh, when a host's immune system is already compromised. So these are pathogens that cause disease only in the very old or the very young infants who have not developed an immune system yet, old people whose immune systems are breaking down, uh, people who have genetic and acquired immunodeficiency diseases, people with other underlying diseases, so maybe someone, you know, people who have organ failures, cancers, other sorts of infections. So maybe, you know, if you're infected by a primary pathogen, that makes you more vulnerable to being infected by other sorts of pathogens that normally wouldn't give you a hard time. Breaches of protective barriers. So if you have an injury, a burn, uh, you've gotten surgery, you're, uh, you have an IV. So anything that breaches your skin barrier, that can make you vulnerable to opportunistic pathogens. So we're finding that many pathogens that we used to think of as primary pathogens are actually more opportunistic. They're, they are, they exist peacefully in most people and only cause disease a minority of the time. So virulence. The de so virulence is the degree to which an organism can cause disease or can cause harm to the host. And virulence is controlled by virulence factors. So virulence factor is all of the physical traits which control virulence. Um, so which control how a mi whether a microbe can infect you and how much, it in uh, how much disease it causes or how bad a disease it causes. All the physical traits which control virulence are controlled by enzymes and proteins. So we also, be because these are all proteins, they all have a DNA gene which encodes them. So the genes are also considered virulence factors as much as the proteins are considered virulence factors. So sometimes when we're talking about a virulence factor, we're talking about the protein, a protein on the surface of the pathogen or an enzyme that it secretes. But we sometimes when we're talking about virulence factors, we're talking about genes moved around by plasmids or by viruses from one bacteria to another. So we can say that the virulence factor gets moved, even though it's not the protein itself that's being moved. It's the DNA that codes for that protein. Um, so virulence factors are related to this list here. So I'll go through this list. So ID50. ID50, so ID stands for infectious dose and 50 stands for 50% of the population. So ID50 is related to how easily a pathogen enters and adheres to a host cell or tissue. So we're talking about the infectious dose 
uh, for 50% of the population. So it's the dose of microbes required to cause infection in 50% of the people exposed to that dose. So the units that we measure ID50 in are number of cells in the case of bacteria or fungi, or the number of virions in the case of viruses. So you have like a number, it's not grams or anything like that, it's just the number of cells or the number of virions. So how many bacterial cells do you need to give, excuse me, how many bacterial cells do you need to give 100 people for 50 of them to get sick? Um, and another way of saying it is how many bacterial cells do you need to give someone for them to have a 50% chance of getting sick? So Every pathogenic species will have a different ID50. The lower the ID50, the lower the dose to make the same number of people sick. So the lower the ID50, the more infectious or the more virulent the pathogen. Right? Um, so ID50 is determined by how the microbe enters the body and also uh, is determined by the proteins it uses for adhesion. So how does it enter and how does it adhere to host cells? The level of virulence of a particular pathogen is also influenced by how successfully that particular pathogen can evade host defenses, how quickly it can multiply within a host, um, and also to the LD50. So LD50 refers to how poisonous the toxins are that, the, that that pathogen produces. So the LD50 of the toxins it produces. So LD refers to lethal dose and 50 again to 50% for 50% of the population. So what is the LD50 or what is the lethal dose for 50% of the population for the toxins that the pathogen uh, produces? So LD50 isn't going to tell you anything about how infectious it is. It's just going to tell you how lethal it is, how harmful it is. So ID50 and LD50 are really different. LD50 is how easy is it to be infected but you can, a pathogen can easily infect many people, but not cause much harm to them because the ID50 is low and the LD50 is high. So it doesn't take many cells or it doesn't take many virions to cause an infection. You might think of the common cold. It's really easy to pick up the common cold, but it's not very toxic, right? It's not killing very many people. So the LD50 is not something to worry about. So I want to talk about ID50 and LD50 a little more because I know that these, these things trip students up a lot. You know, first of all, students wonder, why, why do we talk about 50%? Why use 50%? Why not 100%? Why not the ID100, the number of cells required to make everyone sick? Well, some people are more resilient and some people are more susceptible than others. So the ID50 gives you a good idea of how the average person responds to the disease. But there's always going to be that one person who doesn't get sick from anything. So the dose required to make everyone, including that one super resilient person, sick, that's not going to represent the average person at all. And it's not going to give you any kind of realistic indicator of how infectious the disease is for most people. So ID50 may differ for the same pathogen depending upon portal of entry. Um, because, you know, as we talked about in the last series of lectures on epidemiology, Pathogens can use more, there are a lot of pathogens that can use more than one entry exit route. So for example, you would probably need fewer cells to cause infection if the microbe was put directly into the bloodstream using a needle, as opposed to eating or inhaling that same pathogen. So the ID50 for bloodborne entry route is going to be different than the ID50 for the uh, oral fecal route for the same pathogen. So I wanted to give a couple examples of some real ID50s so that we can get, you know, some solid numbers here. So we've talked about Burkholderia before. Burkholderia is one of those especially difficult to kill microbes. Remember, the genus Burkholderia, they are gram negative, so they have that extra protective outer membrane, that extra protective lipid bilayer. Um, so they have the cell membrane, they have a cell wall, and then they have an outer membrane outside of that. So gram-negative bacteria are already a little bit more resilient, but Burkholderia species, they have those chemical pumps, right, that allow them to pump out poisons, pump out antibiotics, pump out disinfectants, so they're especially resilient against those microbial control methods. So Burkholderia mallei is extraordinarily infectious because it has a very low ID50. So the ID50 for Burkholderia mallei and for Burkholderia pseudomallei is only 10 cells. That means it only takes 10 cells to infect 50% of people 
who are exposed to that quantity of microbe, right? So if you gave 100 people each 10 cells of Burkholderia mallei, 50% of them would get sick because that's the ID50 for Burkholderia mallei. Because of their low infectious dose, Burkholderia mallei were listed in the United States as a select agent and a priority pathogen of biodefense concern by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. So this is considered a priority pathogen because of the low ID50. So low ID50 is more infectious. In contrast to the ID50 of 10 cells for Burkholderia mallei, Vibrio cholerae, which causes cholera, has an ID50 of 100 million cells, so 10 to the 8th. That means you have to give 100 people 100 million cells of cholera each for 50% of them to come down with the disease cholera. So we think of cholera as a fairly awful disease, but you actually need a lot of cells. You have to ingest a lot of cells of Vibrio cholerae in order to come down with cholera, to have a 50% chance of coming down with cholera. So lethal dose is pretty much the same idea, right? but we measure it differently. So lethal dose is not for cells, it's not for pathogens, but rather it's for toxins. So you'll see the LD50 listed for you know, pesticides that you buy for your home. So the LD50 is the amount of toxin that would kill 50% of the people who ingested that dose. Um, so botulism toxin, it's one of the top three most potent toxins known to man. The, lethal, the, I, the LD50 is one to three nanograms per kilogram. So it's tiny. It's, it's one of the, so that's why it's in the top three most lethal. So we measure the LD50 in nanograms or milligrams or grams. So we measure the mass as opposed to the ID50, which is measured in number of cells or number of virions. Right, so evolution of pathogenicity. Now remember, it doesn't make sense for a pathogen to kill its host. Right? It, that's a dead end for a pathogen. So pathogens that are extremely harmful, they have to have a really good exit strategy from their host because we've talked about this in the last series of lectures. There's two options for, the, for a pathogen. They're, they're either going to get kicked by the host's immune system or they're going to kill their host. So those are the two options. So they, the lineage has to exit before one of those two things happens. They have to have an exit strategy. So why are there so many pathogens if, it, if it's not evolutionarily beneficial? So I just want you to remember that nature doesn't have a plan for evolution. Mutations are random. They're not directed. All something has to be to survive is good enough to, make, to reproduce. So nothing has to be perfect. Nothing has to have the perfect strategy. They just have to have enough, a good enough strategy to make a new generation. So pathogens that are good enough to reproduce will survive, even if they don't have the most efficient strategy for survival, even if they don't have the best strategy for survival, as long as their strategy is good enough with the mutations, the random mutations that they have, to produce a new generation. And that's why we have pathogens. Even though it's not phenomenal, there's a lot of problems with the, the state, the condition of being a pathogen. As long as the pathogen can reproduce, it's going to persist. But the fact of the matter is that many pathogens lose virulence over time and become less deadly to us. And we talked about that, again, in the epidemiological chapter. We looked carefully at how, you know, especially pathogens that require contact between hosts for transmission, it's the less harmful that are more likely to spread because the more harmful reduce the host's ability to get around and contact other healthy hosts to spread it. So syphilis and leprosy are great examples. Syphilis has gradually, uh, has gradually reduced its virulence during the 19th and 20th centuries. The symptoms of leprosy also became less severe over time. Remember that Spanish flu was a major exception to the usual rule of evolution towards mildness, and this had to do with the unique conditions of human ecology, which led to its spread, the unique conditions of war. So the human environment changed, and that's what changed what was beneficial for that particular pathogen. Remember, during wartime, that pathogen did not need to rely on healthy hosts to successfully transmit from one host to another. And I also want you to remember that the majority of microbes are not pathogens that kill their host. There is, if you looked at a pie chart of all the microbes out there, a subset of them would be human symbionts, a small subset of them would be human symbionts, and a tiny, tiny sliver of that would be pathogens. The vast majority of microbes that interact with us 
are not pathogenic. They're either commensals or mutualists. So I'm going to bring back this flow chart from the last series of lectures on epidemiology. Remember, for a pathogen to be a pathogen, it has to follow these five steps. There has to be a portal of entry into the body of the host. There has to be adherence to host tissue or host cells. Then the pathogen has to be able to penetrate or evade the host's defenses, which those are the immune system. Um, then it has to cause damage to host cells, and then it has to find a portal of exit. Steps, so we covered step one and step five, entry and exit in the epidemiology chapter. So right now we're gonna focus on the middle three steps, adherence, evading host defenses, and causing damage to host cells. Um, so it's important to note that commensals and mutualists of our microbiomes must also enter the host and e adhere to host cells and evade host defenses. The difference is that they do not cause damage to host cells, or if they do, they are worth any damage that they cause due to something that they are giving back. But our microbiome microbes also have to follow at least four of these five steps. <clears throat> 